The playoff pressure is on. It's a different atmosphere and a different type of intensity for these pro players. Coming up, we talk with former Chiefs player turned health system doc about the physical demands these players are under and dive deep into the mental stress for them and the rest of us as we watch at home. Good morning. It's a very happy Monday here. It's January 23rd. I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome to the Morning Medical Update and to the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. It was a weekend full of football. The Kansas City Chiefs kicked off their playoff run with a big thrilling win. So each team and the fan base, they have one goal, win the Super Bowl. No pressure, right? Well, we're going to look at the coping methods and handling this type of high anxiety. So get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right here on your screen. Well, it is down to the final four teams fighting for the Super Bowl. Here are the winners from this weekend's four divisional round games. This coming Sunday, January 29th, is the, uh, well, it's Championship Sunday. Your Kansas City Chiefs are going to take on the Cincinnati Bengals at Arrowhead. We will watch the teams battle it out this Sunday to take the titles of AFC and NFC champions. And today, we have an incredible, very excited panel with us today. We're going to be joined by uh, Chiefs team physician and sports medicine physician with the health system, Dr. J.P. Darsh, who also happens to be a former NFL player himself. How are you? Good morning. Doing great. Good to see you. We also have uh, joining us virtually today a sports psychologist, Dr. Brett Woods, along with Jennifer Medlin. She's a nurse manager um, out at the Sports Medicine and Performance Center here at the Health System. And you might recognize her from the sidelines. She's a former Chiefs cheerleader. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see yeah. you in red today yes. with a big smiling face. Oh, yes. I know you asked me where my red was. I was like, I've got to get on it. Okay, I promise. Next, next, next week. You better. Next Next week, Dr. Darsh, everything is on the line, as we know, for these players. Well, you know, because you've been there. Um, you either you win, you're in, you're, you lose, you're out. Um, kind of tell us what it's like at this moment in, in the game, in, well, in the season, in the you know postseason. Yeah, it's kind of the fun part of the season. You know, they, yeah. they've been at it since, uh, you know, even without counting the offseason, since July they've been in training camp. So uh -huh. we're talking six-plus months of, uh, of practicing, working, and um, – this time of year, everything it matters a little bit more, right? Now there's only four teams left, and for the players, it's the reward at the end of the day. It's it's when they they get to really, uh, it's the most fun part of the year. Everybody chips in, and uh, you know you go around practice. There's always a little more intensity, a little more, uh, um, you know, need to win. You know, the guys are really fired up. Right. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, our excitement, of course, is is always hyped up a little bit more. But for them, you, you say that the the need to win just keeps starts creeping, 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 right? Oh, no doubt. I mean, every game, every step of the way that that, that you make it in the playoffs, you know, the stakes are higher and the competi the the margin of victory is so small in the NFL that just making it this level it, it, at that point is hard. So, uh, so they they keep working and hopefully, you know, you keep one week at a time. Hopefully we keep playing. Well, like I said, you've been there, so it's always interesting to get your perspective. But now, on the flip side, as a, t as a team physician, what types of things are team doctors doing across the NFL to make sure that players are ready for this type of intense play? Well, yeah, and that goes back to basically all the way through their preparation in the off season. You know, and, and during the season, there's all the stuff, the, the strength coaches, the athletic trainers, which do they do the day-to-day -day stuff with the players. Here, as the physicians, we're there to take care of uh, any injuries or any, um, any illness, anything that might come up during the season. And we work together with the trainers and the, uh, uh, and the players. These guys are professionals. You know, they take care of their bodies. They know same old thing that we all tell the high school athletes, you know, hydration, sleep, and taking care of yourself uh, throughout the week. You, you don't just take care of yourself the day before the game. It's, it's a seven days a week thing. Year 365, right? Yes. Yes. Dr. Woods, thank you so much for being with us today. So much chatter, as we know, online, everywhere we turn. People are talking. Um, how are these players able to manage kind of the scrutiny and that noise coming into their, to their mental game? Um, or is that just kind of all part of it? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the world of sports is full of a lot of sayings and phrases. And one of them that I absolutely love is pressure is a privilege. And it's like Dr. Darsh was saying, these guys are professionals that have been trained their entire careers for moments and opportunities like these. Uh, so there are two highly successful organizations in the Chiefs and the Bengals. Uh, they've been here before. They were in the AFC Championship game last year. Uh, and the truth is they have a lot of trust and confidence going into the or because of the organizations and the coaching staffs and the players they have in the system. 
and they're not going to deviate much from their their typical routines. Uh, yes, they're going to work hard, but they know what it takes in order to win, and they're just going to stick to that preparation. Um, and the the other thing is that um, w with pressure, sometimes you get caught up in the outside distractions and noise. I think fans put a lot of emphasis onto that, but for the most part, that just gets tuned out. Um, now, granted, they are highly success, uh, successful and competitive individuals, and some may use that as motivation. I know the Chiefs have lost three in a row to the Bengals, so there may be some out there that use that as motivation and fuel, but the reality is they're, they're ready, they're prepared, they're confident going into this weekend. Pressure is a privilege. I really, I like that, kind of flipping, flipping that message around a little bit, really thinking of it differently. So, Jennifer, I want to talk to you professionally um, as a nurse, but just take us down there, kind of paint that picture from a cheerleader's perspective. And I think we've got some pictures from you back in the day. Um, kind of what is it like from this type of, what do you see as a cheerleader and, and on those sidelines? What are you witnessing as far as what these guys are going through? So, some of the really good part for when I cheered and from now is we have really good seasons right now. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So I was lucky enough to have a really good season. So when you're in the tunnel getting ready to come out, you got the nerves, you're, you're anxious, you know you have all your performing, and then you come out. And because of the crowd, I mean, we're there to pump up the crowd, but fortunate for us, the crowd is always pumping us up as well. So we are ready to go. And so it makes it really easy to, to be able to do that. Um, there is no feeling like being on that field with the crowd roaring. There, it's a feeling that you can't even describe. You kind of get chills, I bet, thinking you about do. it. You do. And um, and just watching the like watching the game this weekend. Sitting at, were you at home or were you at the game? Oh, I was at home. You were at home. Um, I'm superstitious. <laughs> okay, you do it where you're <laughs> supposed to do it. I love that. But do you still feel that feeling that you felt? Um, or do you? It, or does it take you back a little bit? It takes you back. I mean, you know that everybody is pumped up. You know what it sounds like. It's just there's there's a feeling. Like I said, when you're on that field with, I mean, there's almost 80,000 people up there cheering and screaming and the loudest stadium in the, in the country. Yes. And so that, that feeling is something that you feel to your core. You got to bottle that up. You do. You got to get that you in a bottle, sell that stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit, though, about what, the type of patients that you treat. Um, you, you've watched at the highest level, the professional mm -hmm. level, but talk to us about what you treat and how you use that, a uh, little bit of that witnessing of, of how those players are cared for on the sidelines to what you do now. Yeah, so we, in our clinics, we see literally anything. We see if you have something hurting, you come to us, we can take care of you, whether you have tripped and fallen or if you have um, gotten hurt in a sport, if you fall off your bike, if you are just having some joint pain because you're older and need some injections, things like that. We treat literally everything um, but on the sidelines what you see is as they go down of course we're all gasping at home mm -hmm. or up in the crowd and you start thinking okay what assessment are they doing and you, you start kind of peeking and kind of knowing what to expect and what you know from your your history and what sure. you've treated already like okay what are they okay they're gonna be okay and then you can take that little breath of fresh see you have that perspective the rest of us don't yeah. to know that it's gonna be okay yeah. Yeah. but that's good to know um, Dr. Woods I know that means we all have this mental game we're playing uh, when when the Chiefs are out there on the field but Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott said that quarterbacks are judged off playoff wins of course we're, we're wishing him much better luck next year perhaps but um, talk about what it's like knowing that you're in the spotlight what tools can players use to to stay mentally focused and of course how can the rest of us apply it just to the rest of our pressure moments uh, on the day-to-day -day? I think it's an interesting example that you you talk about Dak Prescott because this morning he's get a lot of criticism and flack from fans and sport pundits about not performing in high pressure situations so that's um, yeah unfortunate for him he didn't um, end up beating the 49ers uh, yesterday. But that being said, I think there are several tools that athletes um, can use in high pressure moments. One thing is our brain absolutely hates uncertainty. Um, it creates lots of stress and worries and anxieties. And the truth is professional athletes are really great at creating routines. Routines create a sense of control, 
a sense of feeling prepared and from that preparation that's where confidence comes from so one of those tools that athletes often use is visualization or imagery uh, so even if you're not physically performing the skill or act just imagine yourself in those high pressure moments and what you're supposed to do and how you're going to respond in the third quarter and the fourth quarter you're getting lots of reps and so it feels like it's deja vu when you're kind of in those high pressure moments so Visualization is one of those tools. Um, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of research coming out supporting mindfulness training. Uh, so mindfulness training is the act of training your brain to get into the present moment. That's where performance happens. Uh, you want to be where your feet are at in the here and now. And so I think some athletes struggle with getting stuck on that last play, good or bad. You just scored a touchdown, you just threw an interception. So you have to learn to let go of that and move on to get in the present moment. Other athletes, they struggle with worrying about things that haven't happened yet. So Mindfulness training is really that ability to teach your mind how to focus into the important things in the, the present moment. And then this sounds so simplistic, but do not underestimate the power of breathing and breathing in a very specific way. So diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing is one of the fastest ways to hack our nervous system, which is our stress response. So it's no wonder that in those high pressure moments, you often see athletes really focusing on that deep breath. It's not by accident or chance. They really know that diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing is a great way of kind of managing their energy and getting to that relaxed, focused state so they can have a clear mind when they're performing. And everything you just said, I was just taking mental note of, I can do that, I can do that. I'm not an NFL player, but I can use this in my daily life and my job and at home with my kids. So um, so those are definitely things to, to take note of. Dr. Darsh, what do you remember from, the, what was it like, not saying that it was that long ago that you were in the NFL, but what was it, is the mental, has the mental, um, focusing on the mental health and, uh, you know, is that has that always been as important as maybe what we think of it as today? Has that been a part of it or was it always physical? Oh, it's always, I mean, the mental part of it is huge. It's uh, for a professional athlete or any kind of athlete, for high school athletes, middle, like youth athletes. Mm -hmm. um, but was it talked about as much back then? Well, I mean, the way that we, seems like we're talking about it more, but is it, <clears throat> is it really present? I think it wasn't talked about it nearly as much as mm -hmm. it is today. Uh, the, the part of, you know, just generally mental health. You know, there's things we see, for example, like when athletes uh, are done, you know, their careers in, whatever, if it, if it ends after high school, after college, or especially after the pros, how, you know, that's the mental part of that is a difficult thing. You know, a lot of these players, you lose your identity, you lose the, the thing that you've dedicated your whole life to, and there's a lot of mental health issues that accompany that. Uh, but, you know, in that part is something that really wasn't talked about as much back yeah. then. Uh, you see more of it now, but you know, the actual like performance kind of mental health part of it is, um, I think that's something that players have always been aware of that. Something it's always to be aware been, of, right. Absolutely. Any thoughts on that, Jennifer? No, I agree. I think, yeah, Back, back in the day, um, it was more of being mentally prepared for the game and being in the moment and being in that zone to perform at your peak. But then now th there is more awareness about it. Um, people, you know, coming to making sure they get treatment, make sure that it's recognized earlier so that they can get the help as soon as they can. Something I noticed, I was watching videos uh, yesterday and that video of, of Trevor Lawrence uh, in the tunnel standing mm -hmm. there. Did you see that? Mm -hmm, I he did. turned and waited for every single player to come off and there were hugs and you know guys with their heads hung low and I felt like uh, and then he just actually stood there for a moment to make sure all the guys were in. I want to make sure all my people are in and it was it was really a touching moment and I felt like Dr. Woods I wanted to ask you what is it what's that mean when you, when you have that kind of camaraderie you know for them to go out and be able to do it next year. Um, it seems like you know the start of next season seems like so far away when you're just now walking off the field with a loss but but is there a real true genuine and sense of loss for these guys and they, they do kind of need that hug if you will and to know that you know there's always next year oh, that's a, a great question i want to go back to what dr darsh was saying earlier you spent months six months plus training and preparing for these moments it's really hard to put into words the type of bonds and connections these players um have over the course of a season and the the reality is that it's not going to be the same team next year guys are going to be traded some guys are going to retire so there is that feeling of loss this was a one-time opportunity with these particular individuals to work towards their goals so there is a bit of sense of loss um but as a professional athletes you quickly have to make that recovery but in that moment i think that was a great with with trevor lawrence a, a great demonstration of of leadership
Mm -hmm, for sure. Uh, I want to ask about, uh, just talk to us about the DeMar Hamlin injury that, that uh, the players had to experience watching, clearly very traumatizing for them, traumatizing for folks at home, not quite understanding what's going on on the field, but kind of um, take us back out there and tell us kind of what that's like when, when they're having to see something like that. Yeah, so, I, you know, watching professional sports, you frequently see people getting injured, but I think for the audience at large and the players on the field, this just had a different feel to it. You saw grown men with tears. You saw the shock, the dismay, the, the sadness, the fear, the anxiety in real time. And I think a lot of the broadcasters after the fact just really didn't know quite what to say because it was a first for a lot of us with this type of medical emergency. Um, in the, the days following when they were having the press conferences with the Bills, uh, the Bills players talked very highly of the head coach um, and what he did to gather the guys and rally the guys because one of the ways of dealing with traumatic stress, really the way of healing through traumatic stress is through connection, connecting to your own feelings and being able to process what you just went through and connecting with others, leaning on loved ones. And from what I could hear and, and see in, the, in those press conferences, the coaching staff did a tremendous job of giving guys space to process what they went through. And uh, the head coach also recognized that there's individual differences in how we process trauma. People process it in different ways and then on different time timelines. So um, I think he was very uh, adept at giving them space just to talk openly, to hug. And some guys, they really relied on their faith and prayer. Some, they needed to verbalize what they're saying. Some maybe needed to write it out or others, they just needed to lean on their loved ones. So I, I think the coaching staff did a tremendous job. And the other part of it is each NFL organization is gonna have a dedicated mental health provider. So for those athletes who may have been struggling and it was interfering with their day to day, they had some additional resources and help. Well, and so often we talk about it's just a game, and, and in many cases it is just a game. But in that case, it was like collectively as a nation, everybody watching it from their own perspective. You as a former player and a physician and as a nurse, and you've seen these types of things happen. And then just as the regular person watching it um, or a parent watching a child, it's a, it was an interesting way to kind of have everybody come together and, and um, certainly then raise awareness about it. So, um, so Dr. Darsh, let's talk. Well, I want to hear what was it like when you saw the Damar Hamlin thing? What, what was so, that? Because I'm sure your phone was blowing up and all that kind of stuff sure, and things yeah. like that happen. It's something you always wish you don't see, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, thankfully as a player, I never went through something like this, that, that big of an emergency. But there's, you know, there's been a number of times where a player gets carted off the field for a neck injury or whatever, big leg, whatever, a big injury that, it, and for a few moments when the, you know, when the, everything calms down and then you're waiting, the player leaves, you're not quite sure what's going on. When it's your teammate or even an opponent that you don't, you might not even know personally, there's always a um, sense of respect and kind of sure. uh, your worry and, you know, when they, the whistle blows and the uh, plays back on, uh, at first it kind of takes a little bit for, not, not everybody's super excited to go back yeah. to playing. You know, it takes a... Because you're uh, a human. Exactly. You go from being a human with feelings to a football player, right. you know, trying to get in the zone, as you said, Jennifer. What were you thinking when you saw that? Um, pretty much the same thing. Um, just, we see that. Um, I used to be in the ICU for a lot of, long time, and we got used to it. The, the general public doesn't get used to doing, seeing chest compressions or seeing something like this. So it's very traumatizing. And yeah, how can you expect them to, to just turn that off? Because it, it's, it's something that you, that you can't turn off. So I was very glad to see that they decided to stop that, um, stop that game and let them move forward and let them heal. I want to put a QR code up on our screen right now because, of course, we know our sports medicine team handles our Chiefs players, but they also care for our community and are those weekend warriors that we talk about and, of course, our young athletes uh, in high schools all over uh, and even in those lower grades. So um, check that out. You can scan it. It'll take you to our sports medicine page. Um, I want to ask you, Dr. Darsh, though, let's say um, there was an injury on a quarterback. Um, how do um, how do teams like yours or a, you know, all all teams have teams like yours working with their players throughout the week and getting them ready for the next playoff game. But um, how are you making sure that they're they're really ready? Um, I think some people think there's a push. To, would there ever be a push to get somebody ready, or, do, or because it's such an intense game and so much is on the line? Uh, you know, how are you really making sure that people are ready to play at their top? 
Well, I think that comes from, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's a whole team, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the athletic training staff is, 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 are the ones spending day to day, every day with the players. Uh, you have the strength coaches that maybe have to modify the, the, the workouts and they want to prevent injuries in the first place. Uh, and then you have the coaching staff that have to be smart about, okay, so how much, how much practice, you know, when, how much practice, when's he ready, is he able to play if he hasn't practiced, stuff like that. And, uh, and then it comes down to the player, you know, uh, how much the players, when they've been in that level, usually they know what they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, especially at this time of year, they all want to play very badly. So, um, you, they just they they'll put in you know guys are injured right now they spend a lot of hours trying to do everything they can to give themselves I would imagine a chance. communication is key to make sure of that course. they're communicating properly like this is too much or I'm ready for more um, yeah. to make sure that they're not pushing it and making it worse correct and all these injuries you know they happen common things are common right so most a lot of injuries that occur are they keep happening so it's everybody's been most players have experienced it before or, and, and you know the doctors the medical the training staff and all that have seen those injuries so everybody kind of has an idea what the, the time frame will be right uh, and um, and then you just hope that seven you know, days it, isn't a long time Dr. <laughs> no <Marsh>. I know <laughs> it's, <laughs> for the rest of us anyway <laughs> yeah it's a, a day to day I guess it is a day to day hour to hour okay let's take a, a quick check and uh, check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson medical director of infection prevention yeah. and control uh, joining us on this Monday how are you yeah Oh, cold Monday. Yeah, it is. I'm good. You know, it good. certainly helped with uh, the Chiefs this weekend. Not so much with the Jayhawks, but oh, I was so sad. Otherwise, okay. I know you must know. have been sad too. <laughs> I know it was a bad week for the basketball team for sure. Right now, uh, we're doing okay as far as the active COVID infections. Right now, we have 69 total cases, but 34 active. Six of those in the ICU and four on the ventilator. So, uh, still. Uh, you know, a little bit higher than we would like. Hopefully we can get these numbers down in the next uh, coming seven to 10 days. Okay, let's, uh, I wanna ask you about this. The newest weekly CDC data shows a drop in not just COVID, but flu and RSV patients showing up in emergency rooms across the country. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post ran a headline saying that this, uh, what we've been calling the triple-demic threat yeah. is starting to fade. Um, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I that, think that's that accurate. And I think we've seen really a, a drop in those numbers since early to mid-December. So we've been doing pretty good, both uh, as a nation community, but also as a health system. And we were reporting our numbers, they were quite high. They were quite higher than we'd really have seen uh, for quite some time, but those numbers dropped off. We kind of stopped reporting those numbers because they came kind of back to baseline. I think we have just a handful of patients in the hospital now with uh, with influenza. So that is dropping. That is true. You know, I would always be wary of a second wave of influenza. That, that does happen as well. Uh, my best guess is that it may be more of an influenza B uh, wave rather than what we have now as an influenza A. Most of those influenza ones A's are the H3N2, and the other ones are the H1N1, uh, pandemic-like strain, but basically we'll kind of wait, see what happens in the next four to six weeks, and see if we uh, do get in a surge in, in new cases of influenza, but right now all the numbers look really good. All right, Doc Hawk, thanks so much. Do yeah. we have any reporter questions on the line today? All right, let's get to our community questions. Jared wants to know how to help his son with feeling too much pressure in high school sports, Dr. Woods, any suggestions on how to talk to him about that feeling that kids feel on, uh, on and off uh, when they're playing and, and involved in sports at a high school level? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a common question that I get from middle and high school parents and, and kids. And so, you know, in the sports psych world, we like to ask a ton of questions. And one of the questions that we ask of youth and adolescent athletes is, what are the reasons why you play in sport? And the most common responses that we get is to have fun, to meet new people and make friends and to learn new skills. So I always come at it from that framework. So whenever an athlete's, you know, having a lot of pressure, I start with the question of what's getting in the way of having fun. And so for a lot of athletes, there are external pressures, this, this emphasis on winning and winning at all costs. And in those cases, that's where I really help athletes focus on kind of a growth mindset. It's more about setting process goals and uh, development. And that means you're gonna make mistakes and uh, you're gonna have to learn how to kind of overcome those mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And in some situations that may be because of the sport environment, they may not feel like they have a great relationship with their coach or their teammates. Maybe they don't feel like they have enough of a role on the team. And that's a great opportunity to sit kind of the kids down and, and talk about problem solving communication, helping them figure out how to communicate in a way to maybe resolve those issues. A flip side of that is more internal pressures. And so 
for quite a few athletes I work with, there's perfectionism and performance anxiety, and that's where I really kind of help athletes develop those internal coping resources, like we were talking about with the breathing skills or visualization. I think the one extra one that I didn't say earlier was really uh, self-talk, being your own best coach, learning how to uplift and support yourself in those high pressure moments, because what you say to yourself in those stressful moments really matters, and we can say things that are gonna be effective and helpful, and maybe we can say things that are gonna be self-critical. So I think it starts with just identifying where it's coming from and then kind of going from there. Great advice. Kayla has a question, uh, Jennifer, for you, wants to know, does your role change in, when we go into playoff season? Do you, as a cheerleader, do those cheerleaders out there feel extra pressure? Um, I don't. I would say there's a little bit of extra pressure because you have a little bit more added to your plate, so you, you don't really plan for the postseason at the beginning of the year. So you're adding um, new routines, new practices. You also, I mean, just like the entire Chiefs Kingdom, um, the adrenaline is going, mm -hmm. the excitement is building. Um, um, but there's also extra um, appearances that you're doing. You are getting out into the community a little bit more. You um, you just have a little bit extra because all these cheerleaders also have regular full-time jobs. Right. Um, so balancing that, it gets a little bit more. Um, but you have the, the really fun appearances of doing pep rallies around the city. Um, so it's really just an exciting time. Yeah, just as a person, yeah. you know, just to be yeah. right there in the center of all of it. Joellen has a question. What's to know how helpful are comments like the sun will come up tomorrow after a big loss. Um, so lovely, but doesn't always, I don't know if that always hits home for people. Um, what's an alternative to that, to that Dr. Woods? Um, and just what about superstitions and rituals? Uh, can you touch on that as well? You know, I was going to comment a little bit earlier on Jen's superstitions. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I know I'm not in studio, Jen, but um, it's more about preparation and routine that leads to confidence. But back to the, the question of the, the sun, the sun will rise the next day. So it's, it's interesting because with a lot of the athletes I, I talk with, as much as it's important to have a pre-competition routine, it really is important that after the game, you also kind of have a routine to let go and move on. So for a lot of athletes, what I talk about is the midnight rule. So after a game happens, you give yourself up until that night to be able to process and reflect upon what you do well, what didn't go well, how could it get better? And then really when that next day does come, you're thinking about, what do I need to do today? How do I attack today? So I think there's actually some some wisdom in, in that the, the sun will rise the next day. And really it's about learning to let go and use yesterday's performance to get better the next day. So, uh, well, Dr. Woods, do you have to get going or do I have you for another few minutes or do you gotta go? Yeah, I, I've got a couple more minutes, yep. Okay, um, so here's one. So. Kathy says, she goes, I worry about Patrick and, and the team. Uh, she worries about his injury, as we all do, and, of course, his mental health, like letting fans down. Don't think he's letting any fans down. But um, he's not responsible for the whole team. He's amazing. But I do worry. Let's just talk about that, the feeling of, you know, we've seen that happen when you're – I'm like, oh, like – I said, as a mom, like I see some young kid like miss a kick or <laughs> miss a catch, and you're like, oh my God, I feel so bad for him, even if it's for the other team. And um, talk about that pressure and what the team really feels, you know, when somebody misses a big key uh, play or catch and um, how they're supposed to feel after like, somewhat letting the, the team and the fans down. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good question as well. So. Patrick Mahomes is obviously the face of this organization, and he's taking the Chiefs to, to new heights. And I, I was seeing some statistics about how many playoff wins they had prior to Patrick Mahomes versus with Patrick Mahomes. So obviously he's an elite level competitor. He's an incredible talent, and I think the team really rallies around him. He's obviously shown very strong leadership skills. That being said, it's a 53-man roster. You've got great coaches in that organization. So like we were talking earlier, it's about a sense of, of community, of rallying around one another. And, and you know Patrick is, it wants to be out there and to, he's going to do whatever it takes to, to fight for his team. But in the same token, I think the guys are going to rally around him. So it, it is hard and there are a lot of emotions connected to potentially missing time or missing out on plays. But as you saw with Chad Henney, he came in as a true professional, led the team on the a uh, record-setting 98-yard drive. He was ready and prepared for that moment, uh, which he'd done in a prior playoff a few years ago. So uh, I'm really confident in this group, and I think it starts just with the organization and having a winning mindset.
I was so happy for Henny. That made me so happy. <laughs> Weren't you guys excited? I always feel like when somebody gets that moment and they're like, yes, I love that. And to uh, hear the Henny thing is possible again. Any, was the really... Henny thing is possible. <laughs> that, is fan... that was fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. A mm -hmm. uh, couple questions. Uh, Carrie wants to know how many doctors are on the sidelines at, at a Chiefs game at any one time? And what, what are so, the different specialties? Yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, and you saw that when the thing happened in Buffalo yes. a few weeks ago, how important that is. So, uh, you know, every team, we always have the team doctors that are there day to day with the, with, the, with the team. So you'll have the two orthopedic surgeons. We'll have two medical doctors. And also every game, there's a, there's a two um, airway physicians, we call them. They're <coughs> the emergency medicine specialists that in case something happens, we're just like happened in Buffalo where you have to resuscitate a player. Like a uh, traveling ER? Emergency so, room, like I mean, everyone so, well, is there for the most part, right? Pretty much, right, and that, that's kind of mandated by the league. So yeah. each sideline has to have an uh, airway doctor, and um, uh, so and that can come in. You know, you rarely need them. Hopefully, you never need them. But that, like, but you that's saw, a perfect example happened. of why there are so many there on the sideline. Exactly, and that's why you know we we practice our emergency action planning few times a year and this mm -hmm. is very like when this happened they knew what to do that's because that's been planned right sure and, and I would like to think that if it were ever to happen on our side like we'd be we'd be ready to go yeah, as well yeah, a little yeah. peace of mind there for sure uh, and then just uh, lastly dr. Darsh Nick wants to know if somebody's injured are there are there certain NFL guidelines as to when they're ready to play or is that something you just have to make as a you determine on your own as a team with the player it, it's a it's a team thing because you know an ankle sprain could be many different things, right? Sure. Or a knee injury. There's a lot of different things. It's it's about, you know, between the player, the staff, the doctors. That's how it. Everything. Every case is individual. Okay, we're going to get to our final thoughts. But Jennifer, I have to ask you. Okay, so I, let's get back to the the uh, rituals and super, superstitions. <laughs> what are yours at the house? Well, I like to think that where I stand and what I am wearing has a lot to do with the win or loss. You said you have like a special place in your closet for all your Chiefs gear. Oh, yeah. Do you have like how do you go and pick out what you're going to wear with the shirt? With the, you got the earrings going. I do. Um, I don't wear the earrings on game day. Why? Um, because we lost when I wore them once, so they will never be worn again on Obviously. game day. Um, we also, um, depending on wins and losses, if I wear that, and there's been a time where I've changed at halftime. I, something tells me I'm not surprised by that whatsoever. <laughs> Dr. Woods, I want to get your final thoughts. Um, just thanks so much for being with us. Great insight. Again, whether you play high-level football and sports or whether you're just regular folks like, like me, like me. Um, lots of great takeaways today, so I appreciate that. Just your final thoughts. Oh, first off, I'm excited about this weekend, and I'm excited to see the uh, Chiefs break that streak uh, against the Bengals this weekend. So... Good luck to Chiefs Nation. Everyone have fun and uh, stay safe. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Woods. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Jennifer, your final thoughts today. You know, there's a lot of amazing cheerleaders on that sideline, mm -hmm. but it takes all of the Chiefs kingdom cheering everybody on to get everybody pumped up and going. All right. Big team effort. Yeah. Dr. Darsh, final thoughts. All I'll say is go Chiefs. Go Chiefs. All right. You're so, so, such a simple man. Simple. Love about simple. you. <laughs> Always good to see you. Thank you all for being here on the Monday. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts. Yeah, just thank you to our guests. You know, I think that, you know, talking about this topic right now with the Chiefs, that's just a microcosm of really what happens uh, in the health system with just so many contributors and collaborators uh, working toward the goal of looking to get that patient better, get that patient feeling better get them home and be healthy. Mm -hmm. Well said. Doc Hawk, thanks so much. And thank you all for being with us today. You can catch our updates anytime by logging back onto YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Tomorrow is another Encore presentation of the Morning Medical Update. And then Wednesday, we are back live with Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Have a great day.
It's a new FDA approved treatment for multiple myeloma and it's injected right into the belly. It's been three years in September I was diagnosed. Mary tried everything from chemo to CAR T therapy and was in compassionate care when doctors tried one more treatment. On the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites, meet Mary and learn more about the monoclonal antibody giving Mary miraculous results. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.